Uh, so, we're here on the couch with Roscoe. He's a South London producer that started out as a garage MC, a bedroom garage MC. We don't want to kind of get the idea too wrong to start with. And he's found himself of being in a position where he's one of those few names that people, even outside of kind of UK bass music or UK street music, are known. I guess the other people you might put in that bracket would be Joy Orbison and Joker. Everyone seems to know the names, even if they don't know the music too well. Um, but obviously a lot of people know your music too, partly because you did a whole load of remixes last year. You told me 15, I misheard that as 50 and thought, wow, that is so 90s. Uh, but 15 is a kind of more manageable number and you've also got a whole load of tunes on your hard drive, I understand. Did you say 500? Yeah, about 500 tunes. Uh -huh. in, I've done them in two and a half years. And I had a full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> Which, incidentally, um, has just become history because you've recently made that transition from working full-time to doing music full-time. And for all of you guys, you know, sometimes you imagine these producers to be off living the life, but actually behind the scenes, often they're having to hold down jobs because that transition from kind of working in music or working full-time on your day job to working in music can be really difficult. So no doubt we'll be covering that as well at some point. The other interesting thing, interesting thing about Roscoe is he kind of is one of those, what you might call, think about your maths classes, Venn diagram DJs or producers who kind of sits across a few different areas. And so you'll find people from different areas of music, kind of housey stuff, funky stuff, dubstepy stuff, kind of interacting with you and your music and often playing beside you. Uh, so he's going to be playing us some of the music that's influenced him throughout the years, some of his own music and maybe a few little exclusives as well, if we're lucky. And so I guess really all we should say is welcome Roska, or should we say Roska, Roska. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. I guess uh, some people might not know about that culture of specials and actually kind of putting your name on records. So, you know, the Roska thing is something that you find on some of your records or certainly when you're playing on the radio or in clubs. For the uninitiated, what is that all about? Um, it was just a trademark. I, I used it on my second EP that I released in August 08, and it was just it was just a thing where I put it on one of the tracks just to distinguish that it's mine, and I just kept using it and using it and using it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's all it that's where it came from. But it it does tap into a kind of venerable tradition of people doing specials, which would be kind of reversioning songs with the DJ's name in it. Yeah. I mean, and you know, a lots of other Marcus Nasty does that a lot. Other yeah, people do right, it yeah. too. So it's not just a, a kind of random thing to do, is it? It's part of a kind of a heritage. Yeah, I mean, I think it all it all spanned down from like sort of dance or having dub plates and stuff, and then it's just kind of just taking that whole sort of movement. And I don't know, I just kind of implemented it, and I think a few others have done it, and it kind of. It's kind of taken up the whole of like whole funky sort of thing. Everybody's doing it. Crazy cousins, you know. So yeah. Now I suppose if we were to file you in a record shop, you would assume that you would fall in the kind of funky file. Although that would, you know, possibly if we were filing human beings in record shops, <laughs> it might put a bit of pressure on the uh, on the uh, walls. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to give these guys a bit of a sense about what funky is like from your point of view. Now, if you're coming from the outside, you might have some assumptions or preconceptions about funky house and what it sounds like. Perhaps you think it's just the soca sound or just the this sound or just a, a kind of whatever it is you think it sounds like. But obviously we have an expert here on the couch, so really we should ask you, um, what is the spectrum of funky music? Um, funky is... It's a, it's a cross between a few genres. It's like, it takes garage, it takes grime, um, it takes electro, um, it takes tribal, it takes, did I say soca? Soca. Um, and it kind of just puts it into one basket. I mean, you'll hear, like, even on some of my tracks or even a few others, like Crazy Cousins or, you know, Invasion Records, those guys, you hear, like, you, you hear the Congos in there, you hear, like, the Skippy beats in there. You know, it's more about the drums as well and, a, you know, a little, a little bit of bass as well in there. So it takes everything from everywhere, you know, dance as well. So, and it just kind of puts it into one basket and some, you know, some people will take, some producers will take some parts of it more than other parts, if you know what I mean, in terms of taking another genre from another genre to make it. So funky is a bit of everything put into one. So if we're thinking about a kind of spectrum, you know, you've kind of got your more soakery people, sorry, your more soakery people, your more grimy people, your more housey people, who are we kind of talking about and who, what do they sound like? Um, 
in terms of like the producer you mean yeah yeah i guess so i guess if we're considering this sort of the next 10 minutes a little bit of a master class in funky from the master himself yeah um then if you're trying to explain if you're trying to explain to people all, if, like all these people here who are interested in music but you're trying to explain what it's really like and um, kind of what's there within the kind of genre who would you talk about and, and what does their music sound like um i'll talk with crazy i'll talk about crazy cousins first of all because um um, they've been doing it quite a lot and they, they, they grew quite big um, quite rapidly as well and uh, I mean they will take their side from more sort of the soulful element uh, more vocal as well where they've got a lot of singing on their tunes um, and it's, it's sort of more it's, it's simple and it kind of it, it's kind of directed more at sort of you know a female audience as well um, you know in terms of the lyrics as well of their songs so that's that's where that's where Crazy Cousins come from um, if you was to say like myself more of my tunes, they're sort of more instrumental um, based where um, they're stripped down. Um, it's more about the bass, the drums, the snares. Um, and it's more it's more darker, so it will, it will come from sort of like your dubstep, your garage, your darker garage sort of um, element. So you've got Crazy Cousins kind of on the party Saturday night side. Yeah. You've got you. Kind of who would represent the kind of like grimier, darker sound? The grimier, darker sound? Um, You've got um, Little Silver. He's got sort of that grimier edge, edge to his, his tunes. Um, also, um, who else? Um, even Scratcher as well. Scratcher's got a more darker end. I mean, he comes from a grimy, grime background anyway, so his tunes will, do you know what I mean? They've, they'll always show that side as well. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Um, Genius as well. Genius sort of, he's in, I'll say he's in between. Um, where he's got that sort of grimy edge, plus he's got the soulful edge, so he's got he kind of he's kind of got that whole kind of got it in one, if you know what I mean. So, um, yeah, they're sort of the main ones, I'd say. Excellent. So now we have, hopefully, for those of you who are not already in the funky world or the funky verse, um, have a little bit of a sense of things, or perhaps even just some names to go and check out afterwards if you're interested. And I guess. All of this thing about the academy is opening your mind to stuff that you don't already know about and perhaps delving in deeper than you would normally. I guess right now is a good time to hear what we're talking about. I know you've selected some music for yeah. us, but can you play us uh, a U tune, a Rosca tune, yeah. uh, so we start hearing what you're about as well as just hearing yeah. us talking about right, it? I'll play, um, I'll play my first track that I released out in um, February 08. Um, it's called Feline. Um, I released it on vinyl and I released it on MP3 as well, so um, some, some of you might have heard it. So and it had a pretty big impact, this record, didn't it? I was making, uh, I was making Grime and Garage um, before. Um, I was making Funky and sort of House. And uh, it just, I don't know, I just, I, I, kept, I kind of kept those in the background and carried on sort of experimenting and, and that's, that's what I came up with this. And yeah, it's just sort of taking elements from what, I've, what I'm used to hearing and making. Um, and then just kind of just imp interprets in on what I'm what I made here. So with Broken Beat, were you involved in that as a fan? Were you going to the clubs or buying the records? No, I was just I was just listening to it here and there because like a lot of um, a lot of the DJs that were into like the house that um, that are, that are um, like DJing to funky and making funky, they were playing like the Broken Beat stuff because they wanted like you know like Bugs in the Attic and uh, even Nathan Haynes as well. Those sort of um, producers so they can sort of get it you know, get that balance, what they wanted. And I think that I think that's where the balance came in, in sort of 08 and 09 as well, where it became sort of, that, that element came into it more and more, and a lot more UK producers got onto making what we what we call funky. Mm -hmm. So for you, what was it about Broken Beat that attracted you? Percussion or drums or what? Um, it's definitely the whole the whole drum structure and the percussion, the way, it's, the way it was laid out is, it was skippy and it was kind of, so, um, most of it, the ones that I was listening to, it was like it was it was kind of smooth sailing. So it was like more like a, a roller, I would say it was. So it just kind of just, do you know what I mean? It wouldn't. It's not like some broken beat. It's really it's broken to the to the point where it's kind of like, do you know what I mean? I can't explain, but it's like so it's like stabby, and you can't. Do you know what I mean? So with with the ones that I listen to, they're more sort of skippy, and they've got that sort of travelling effect to it. So mm -hmm. yeah, is the skippiness something? that you kind of picked up through your time listening to UK Garage. Is that part um, of why you like it? Yeah, I mean, I listened to Garage and I was listening to like a lot of like Timbaland and like a lot of producers that would, and even drum and bass as well, where it was, 
you know, the percussion and the drum patterns were sort of so skippy and it kind of, do you know what I mean? I'm really, I'm really fascinated by drum patterns and the way they, they're constructed. So that's why um, some of my tunes are like really skippy as well. So if you say you're fascinated by drum patterns, what does that really mean? Um, does that mean that you'll be listening out for records with that or when you hear a record with an interesting drum pattern, you're trying to work out how it was done or simply that you spend a lot of time building drum sounds? Um, I, I spend a lot of time building drum patterns, but like I just like the way they're constructed. I don't really like look into the way how they're done, but I like the way that they're actually constructed in terms of like the way they the way they actually roll and the way they've actually made the tune travel. Um, that's what that's what I like anyway. Yeah. So more about drums as a kind of way of carrying you through a tune rather than being particularly focused on using certain sounds to make your drums sound a certain way. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about drums just for a minute longer. Um, you use Fruity Loops. That's right, yeah. And you've been using that for a long time. About 10 years, yeah. Uh huh. So why is Fruity Loops a good package for you to be using to get... Because obviously the drum sounds that you yeah. get is one of the reasons why people really like your tunes. So why is Fruity Loops good for you for that? Um, I just find it quick to use. I mean, I can turn my computer on and just get straight on it and I can make a drum pattern within seconds on there. Mm. Um, so it just it gets me... My, my ideas that I have in my head, I can quickly put them down. Um, on there, and I've, I've, I find it, I find it easy to use for so long. So I, I, I was going to change to using Logic, but I can't be bothered. <laughs> be it's, it's a lot, a lot of learning. Yeah. How about um, why don't you play us something else of yours, and then afterwards talk us through something about how you built the drums, or something specific about how you did it? Okay. Would you be happy to do that? Yeah, sure. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to play this uh, track from my album. Um, it's coming out in April. Um, this one's called Tomorrow Is Today. Uh, now, you play at quite a broad spectrum of venues, don't you? I was, when I was um, looking the other day at your MySpace, I noticed that you're playing at, where was it? Um, so you're playing at Dirty Canvas with Scratcher. Yeah. Uh, you've got something coming up at Chocoblock, which I'm going to ask you about, because that's an interesting event in its own right. And then you're playing at a club called Sexy Plastic <laughs> at a night called La Chita. Um, I'm not sure about that one yet. I've, I mean, I, <laughs> I just put it under MySpace, but uh, yeah, I'm, I kind of just... Uh, I mean, no disrespect to Sexy Plastic. It might be the like, <laughs> baddest club on the earth. But the point is, is that they all sound like quite different venues yeah, exactly. with quite different crowds. Yeah, I mean, um, I can definitely talk about the first two. Um, I think the first two are quite similar a little bit because... But um, well, Dirty Canvas, the actual Dirty Canvas um, night, um, it's, it's more, it was more orientated for like grime and garage, whereas um, now they're kind of moving over to the spectrum of like funky and kind of widening the horizons dubstep as well has been heavily involved as in that as well. Um, and uh, Chock-a-Block. <laughs> um, yeah, what is Chock-a-Block? I have no idea, 100%, but I know, I know it's like, <laughs> I know it's like, um, it's, it was, it's mainly grime. I mean, I think I'm the only funky DJ on the lineup. Um, I'm doing like a half an hour slot on there, but it's like, yeah, that's, that, that's mainly grime, but obviously a lot of the grime sort of DJs and stuff, or the nights, they do like a bit of the funky as well, so. See, I thought you were going to give us some grimy insights about <laughs> the kind of like the rough and tumble at Chocker Block, but no, no. you're just going to have to find out for yourselves. Sorry. <laughs> um, so where did we... See, I was expecting you to talk about that for a bit longer, and my mind has not yet moved on to what we're going to talk about next. I know what it was. So we've talked about a few places you play, but there's also a whole load of clubs which are, you know, sort of under the umbrella of funky. Yeah. And again, I guess as part of this, making sure that we're reaching out to all of you guys who are not London born and bred. Um, tell us about the difference between, say, a Coolie G funky night or something at Plastic People or something you might find at the kind of uh, slightly grittier end of the scale. Cool. Um, I find there's like two or three different types of funky events where you've got, um, you've got like an R&B slash... Um, funky event where you've got you've got one room where it's playing hip hop and R and B, and then you've got another room which will have funky in there and garage as well, mate. Um, um, and you'll find at those events you'll hear like um, tracks like um, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, like your nursery nursery rhyme sort of stuff, um, and sort of more the grimy element as well, and garage stuff are more more for the girls as well. actually not not even grimy, but more for the girls I'd say. So is this like sunglasses and Ed Hardy? Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, strike a pose sort of rage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, you've got um, you've got like um, raves where like Cooley G will play where they're more sort of um, um, how can I put it? It's like even where I play as well. It's like dubstep, dubstep based producers and DJs that like funky, like the darker end of funky. So that's that's where you'll get. That's where I would play, um, and it's more it's more jeans, trainers, and sort of dress how you you know you woke up this morning sort of thing. Whereas, yeah, you wouldn't have to sort of, you know, front after shave and a, do you know what I mean, to look good and impress. Mm. There's no one to impress. Because actually, Cooley G is another kind of person similar to you that people know about. She's kind of, her and her music have sort of um, risen above the parapet. So again, people know her name, even if they don't necessarily That's know right, yeah. the tunes inside out. Yeah. Do you know her from South London? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I don't. I only started knowing her from like, like sort of, I think it was like a year ago through like Funky. I mean, she um, she was making like Funky, but what it was is uh, it wasn't really fitting into the sort of typical sound of Funky. Even my stuff as well, it doesn't hundred percent fit into what everybody would play um, in Funky. So that's why it kind of crosses over to Garage, Dubstep, and a few others. So it kind of where it, where we didn't fit in there, we've kind of spread over to a few other genres where you've got like Code Nine playing um, our tracks and um, who else as well just a few other people um, across the across the border as well because she's got um, she's got music coming out on hyperdub or she's put music out on yeah, hyperdub right, yeah. and her own stuff as well um, yeah what else what else what do you like about what she does um, I think I think Cooley's tunes they they're, they've got that mellow sort of effect to the tune and um, I like the drum patterns as well, the way she kind of, do you know what I mean? But with with her drum patterns, I was, like I was mentioning before, they're like, with mine, with the ones that I like, it's like they're more sort of rolling, whereas her ones have sort of got that sort of broken feel to it, which is good as well. And, uh, you know, even the singing as well, because I know she does her own singing on there as well, which is pretty good, so, yeah. That's something I wanted to ask you. Now, Funky has loads of, lots more vocals than, say, Dubstep did, and lots of girls singing. Now, if you think over... Um, sort of on other areas of music, like say for example in indie, it's suddenly become really acceptable for boys to sing. So you'll have like, you know, like boys singing really beautifully, often quite high. You know, if you think about I don't know Fleet Foxes or whatever, it's kind of it's gone from not being very masculine to sing to being kind of like a, a thing to do. Like, where are the boys, the kind of male vocalists out there? They're all Why hiding. Why aren't they? Why They're aren't they stepping <laughs> up to the microphone? They're hiding. They want to be masculine. <laughs> so something's happened elsewhere in music which has made it kind of okay for boys to sing but that hasn't doesn't seem to be the case oh why is that why don't i mean like you just you said they don't want to sing because they want to be masculine but uh, why I, is that idea there I, no i'm only joking i don't i don't i, I don't know you know I, I i think there there are a lot of singers out there but i just don't think they're sort of you know they're just not really maybe they're not in the right sort of or maybe they're not interested in sort of funky because i think uh, in funky, you find that a lot of um, a lot of singers come through, and they really want to do R and B or pop, mm. but they come into funky to find it to come in because it's new. Yeah, they can get the tunes. They, yeah, they can get in there and get a tune out there in the charts, and then go on to what they really want to do. Mm. So really, I mean, but uh, who wants to? You know, really, you don't want vocalists who see funky as a springboard for something else, do you? You want people who That's are right. in it because they're going to be bringing the right energy and the right, right yeah. feeling. So who are there any vocalists that you think you consider to be in that latter camp, you know, the ones that are really in it, they fully feel it, and it's the thing for them rather than being a kind of stepping stone to something else? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you've got Katie B. Um, definitely, she's done a lot of tunes. Um, and uh, even even my vocalist as well, Jamie George. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, who else as well? I think you've got, like, um, there's another singer, AL. Um, and uh, I think there's another one, a Catrio as well. And yeah, so they're, they're, they're the few that I would say they're probably sticking around, but they do a few other things as well, I think, as well, like um, R&B, so. Mm. But uh, they, yeah, it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a weird one. I mean, there's, there are a few singers about, but you, it's, like, it's like everybody tries to look for an exclusive singer that's not sort of been in the scene for a little while and then you know, they end up going somewhere else. Mm. <laughs> do you reckon that there are MCs, like grime MCs or just MCs generally, who actually can sing? I haven't come across one yet. <laughs> I was going to say, I wouldn't show you. I bet you any money, like, they're there, spit bars in front of everyone, being all nasty, but Singing at home, the they're just like, ah. <laughs> I reckon some of them sing. I reckon someone should step forward and uh, 
name of the singing MC. Um, I guess this is a good time to hear another piece of music from you, perhaps something vocal. So you mentioned Jamie George, but there's also a vocal track on your new album. So perhaps you should select one or the other. Or perhaps we can listen to both, one after each other, to hear something vocal that you've done. Um, yeah, I'll play the Jamie George one. I'll play... Um, this one on there. He's Dex, um, he's Mixer, and they used to be they, you, you, they used to roll in like a crew, and then they will go to they go they'll go to the club, set up their own their, their sound system, and then just play play for like you know the whole night up until early hours in the morning, um, and that was that was what he did, and that was what he specialised in. What, what was your dad's crew? Um, I don't remember what my dad's crew was, but he, he had he went into a, another crew of my uncles as well, and they were called Ecstasy back in the day. Yeah, they, that was a good like fifteen odd years ago. <laughs> so this is kind of seventies sort of reggae business. Yeah, the time yeah. when people like Shaka were and Saxon were sort of right. ruling the roost. Yeah, Saxon. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So were they? Did they kind of clash any of those guys, or were they um, were they in a slightly different area? I think they were in a slightly different area. Um, I didn't really like delve into it too much, but I just. I was just always around when my dad was testing the seed, the, um, the music, you know, when I was really, really young, even my uncles as well. And I think I spent more time with my uncles when they were around, even wiring up speakers, all soldering irons and stuff like that. So I remember all those things when I was really, really young. So did your dad used to take you, you know, like, I was talking to someone the other day about, um, they, they were talking about reggae dances and how when they couldn't get to sleep and their dad used to play reggae dances, the dad used to take them down to the dance yeah. and then when they were kind of sleepy, take them home and put them to bed. Um, so did you ever get taken to dances or to kind of cutting houses or anything like that? I didn't that? get taken to anything. You were in bed. <laughs> I was grounded now. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really like keep in touch with my dad after, after, like, after a little while. It was just like, you know, that's like my, my vague memories were just him testing records and just seeing the big speakers around. Um, after that, I kind of spent more time with my uncle in his studio um, and just working out how to, you know, make music. Um, and, like, just, just I've been there when it's, been, when it's getting set up during the day and then, you know, I mean, when, and when, you know when night time comes, you just sit, you're in bed, so <laughs> elsewhere. Yeah. So did being around that give you kind of technical inspiration as well? I mean, you just talked about sort of, you know, the sort of re-soldering of everything and sort of on the day and the kind of ad hoc modifications of the equipment yeah, as I mean, you go through. I mean, they had big speakers. I mean, now I'll just go down to Digital Village and go and buy a, sp <laughs> buy a set of speakers. It saves me the time. But um, no, it just kind of gave me that insight of, you know, where they came from, their background and, you know, what they had to do. Because, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't about have you know, money wasn't exactly the greatest, you know, thing to have at that time. It was just, it was, it was just about, you know what I mean, trying to do make do with what they had and, um, you know, if they could find, you know, an old piece of chipboard and just kind of square it out and make a speaker out of it, you know, that's what they would do. I mean, you know, time marches on, obviously. Oh, God, I'm Marshall Jefferson lyric, nothing stays the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, things do change, and obviously it's not just about looking at the past and thinking it was perfect and it now it's rubbish or whatever. Um, but do you think there's something about uh, being involved in music where you, you have to make everything and you have to make do with what you've got, which somehow has some qualities that you don't get when you can just go down to Digital, vi digital Village and buy something? Um, I think it does. I think it gives it that more enjoyment because they're, you know, and obviously they're saving money as well. But yeah, I think it gives it that more enjoyment of, you know I mean? They have to go and source the, the, the actual uh, um, material to go and make what they need, you know, make the speakers that they need for the night. So I think that's what they, they got out of it as well. And they enjoyed the music as well. Have you come across anyone in the kind of modern environment who's doing something similar in terms of making their own stuff or um, I suppose people do modify equipment, but is there anyone that you can think of that kind of has that element in what they're doing? Um, I think times have kind of gone a bit far now, whereas, you know, it's so easy to just obtain something and I think prices have gone down as well. And You know, um, I, I was speaking to Zinc about it before and he was saying, you know, you know, you know, it was it was so difficult then. You know, you either had to have your own studio, or you had to hire a studio. Whereas now you can have a studio in your own home. So I think times have just advanced so much that it's easy to obtain those pieces of equipment without having to build it yourself. Um, and yeah, just just save just save a lot more money. I mean, you mentioned just a minute ago this idea of you kind of hanging out the window with your aerial, trying to get some reception. <laughs> um, what was it you were trying to get reception for? <laughs> Rinse FM. <laughs> <laughs> of which now you are part yeah, of the esteemed yeah. team Rinse. Yeah. Um, and what were you listening to on um, Rinse back in the day? 
me and my brother used to listen to um, a lot of like pay as you go um back in the day um a lot of like um wiley as well and radio in the evenings um because we lived in um i lived in thamesmead which is like just past greenwich near the dome um and uh, the reception was kind of a bit thin there so we just used to have a load of hangers and just hang out but yeah we used, that's what we used to listen to and like it weren't really there weren't really much happening on our round in sort of the southeast of london it's mainly in east london where you know grime was um obviously we had like so solid which is in it's in south like southwest but even the reception there was quite terrible to get a you know listen to the stuff we wanted to listen to and sort of tv didn't really have like you know stuff like one extra when i wanted to listen to it and um choice of him wasn't playing the stuff that i wanted to hear so you know I mean, we had to go to pirate radios to listen to what we wanted to hear so have you got something with you that will illuminate to us what you wanted to hear yeah sure um Uh, this is a track um, by Wiley and uh, Roll Deep. This one's called uh, Wickedest Ting. Let me get the right side up. Please. Played it's the wrong side. <laughs> oh, we just covered for you. <laughs> it's all right, don't worry <laughs> you about it. You have to tell them. <laughs> So that was on Grimy Volume 1, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, okay, I'm just, just going to ask you about Grimy Volume 1. But actually, I think what's more interesting is thinking about the different personalities on that tune. So how aware were you, as a listener, of the different MCs that are on that and their different styles and what they were bringing to it? Um, I mean, with this tune, uh, it was like, it brought everything that I wanted to hear, if you know what I mean. It had, like, the, you know, my influence of, like, Bashman in there as well you know you've got like flow down on there with his sort of um with, like talking patois which is like jamaican sort of um language and uh you know you've got wiley as well which has got the co he's got sort of a cockney sort of you know um english flow on there and it kind of it just brought everything to what i wanted it just everything was just there and even like the, from the track the track as well just the instrumental as well um you know it's it's quite a simple beat but it was it, if you listen to it it's like I don't know, it just had what I wanted to hear in there in terms of the drum pattern um, the, from the kick and the, even, just a, even just the snare as well. It's just a simple snare. Who's your favourite MC in Roll Deep? Um, my favourite's always been um, Wiley. I um, don't know, he's just, he's, again, he's, he's, his flow is simple, but it's, um, he can fit in what he needs to fit in. And he's really smart in what he says as well, so that's why I like him. So kind of during the grimy times, or early grime, what else were you listening to? Um, I was listening to um, LB as well, LB and Jada Flex as well. Um, I got this tune called, um, this one's called The Club. So before we press play on that, yeah. can you give us a little bit of context for people that might not know? How how different is this from the kind of Roll Deep event of things and how was it at the time? Because at the time, whilst it's kind of seen as separate now, there yeah. was an awful lot of overlap, wasn't there, between what we're going to hear and what we just heard? Yeah, I mean, with this track, it's like, um, this is like early dubstep, I would say, um, where it's sort of the more darker end. Even though what I just played, yeah, that was, that was it's classed as grime. It was more, it was garage as well. Um, so... It was even though it's not as uplifting as some of like a vocal tune that you might hear, it's like um it's not as dark as this one will be. So sounds a bit mad, but yeah. <laughs> Basically hold Yeah, time. you'll you'll understand when I play it anyway, so you know, people had to pay to go on pirate radio. The fact that you were contributing to the upkeep of it um had some impact on the way people connected with what they were doing. I think so. I mean, um, some stations you go on, um, well, when that I used to go on when I was younger, you'd go there and you'd, you'd wonder what I'm actually paying for because the actual, <laughs> the actual equipment was quite uh, crappy. But um, I don't know. It's, yeah, it just depends on where you go. And if, I mean, most, most places you'll go to is like, you know, they look after it well. Um, 
and you know you can see where your subs are going and I think that did I think that kind of helps as well and, and you feel positive about going and you look after the equipment and stuff and you know so you're two or three months on horror FM yeah. you know was that like your typical kind of pirate station in a hole in a kind of wall in someone's kitchen up a tower block or, or was it less cartoonish than that um I think my one I think it was in a printing place um in Battersea you went so there like you an went in industrial estate um well, yeah, sort of. It was like um, it was just like one building that was on like a dead end road, and you go in there, and it's like a printing place, and you walk up through the stairs, and then you know it's just in one little room that's like looks like a cupboard, and you go in there, and it's just baking. You know, you can you can actually cook yourself in there. <laughs> it's, it's that hot. But um, yeah, it was like that. I mean, um, where else did I go? Um, I think I went. I went. No, I didn't actually go to Light at the, in the end. We was meant to go, but we didn't. I think horror was the main one that we went to, and I, w I went to another one, an internet-based one in um, uh, it was out just in the outskirts of London. Um, I won't mention the name because they're still open. Um, and uh, they, yeah, they, their subs were a bit more higher. I, so I was paying petrol as well to get there, and it was just a bit more hassle. But um, yeah, I think uh, quite a lot of quite a lot of um, MCs and DJs went on there that I knew that were quite big as well. Mm -hmm. So with with that, I think yeah, it was just kind of. It was it was good to be on a station that had a lot sta a lot of status that had you know big, big uh, big artists on there. So it'll give you that sort of more exposure because you'd think that those people that were on there, you'd have their listeners as well locked in because they'll be wondering when they're mm -hmm. next on there. So mm -hmm. yeah. So you joined the Rinse team what last summer? Um, roughly about Autumn? last summer, but I've, I was doing a few cover shows for about six months. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was kind of waiting for a slot, but I was getting a bit sort of uh, impatient and I kind of wanted to jump on a few other stations instead, but I kind of just waited and sort of waited out a bit and uh, kept calling rinse management to see if there's anything available and uh, something came up in the summer, which was pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's so funny when you listen to rinse because everyone's got such a different style. You know, you listen to Marcus Nasty and, you know, within the first five minutes he might be threatening some promoter or, uh, or, <laughs> or kind of, you know, you get this... Uh, I'm sure some of you might be aware of Marcus Nasty's catchphrase. Oh, yeah. Shitter! <laughs> <laughs> but your show's kind of a little bit different from that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, um, with my show, it's, it's like a little bit laid back, um, and I just kind of just play all... Like I've done a few shows where I just play my own stuff, um, like for just two hours, or I'll play whatever's new, whatever's available. But um, again, it just boils down to like the different styles that we were talking about earlier, where markers will play sort of stuff that kind of is on that sort of edgy grimy element and then you'll mix in with you know a few of the sweeter vocals whereas my one sort of straight sort of darker which crosses over to sort of like dubstep and you know sort of the darker side of garage as well mm -hmm. and what does it mean to you to be on rinse um to be on rinse um it's a, it's definitely a good thing um represent representing a new sound i think that's what it means to me to be on rinse because at the moment um funky is still new um, the sound that I play is still new as well, and uh, it's like um, rinse is all about having new, new, um, new artists and new, new genres of music and everything new and different styles. So I just represent that really, and that's what rinse represents. So that's what it means. Mm -hmm. So I guess you know rinse are going for their license at the moment, aren't they? That's right. Yeah. Um, and there's a big petition on the website and. You know, there's a lot of momentum towards them, you know, becoming or sort of making that transition from online to legal. Um, how would you feel about playing on legal rinse? On, uh, yeah, well, I don't know what you would call it, on uh, licensed rinse, shall licensed we call it? Rinse. Like, let's call it licensed um, rinse. I'll be, I'll be pretty happy. I mean, um, as far as we know, nothing's going to change. It's all going to be the same. The only thing that's going to be changed is that we're, we're, we're legal. Um, so as far as that, I mean, I'll, I'll still be happy and I'll just, you know, keep re representing Rinse everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because it really is the, you know, the, it really is the kind of hub of everything that's good. That's I mean, right. They, oh. they do such a fantastic job of curating kind of new music, don't they, and reaching out to people and making sure that the kind of the best people are on there. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, majority of the stations, even the DJs on other, on legal radio stations, they listen to Rinse to get from what we get, you know, and try and take away what, what we have to and portray it on their stations. Mm -hmm. I mean, Genius once explained one of the things he does with Rinse on a regular basis is destroy and rebuild, where he'll just, 
you know, get the station to this sort of point where it's totally amazing and perfect and then decide that he wants to move on to something new. So we'll just dash everything and then we, we build it from scratch. And that's kind of what he did around, I guess, 2006, 2007, maybe when it was kind of predominantly dubstep and then yeah. that shift happened again. And that's a pretty radical way of operating. You know, you make something brilliant and then but you're constantly always looking to make it different. Um, I don't really know what the question is associated with that statement um but i suppose you know what's do you find that being on rinse forces you to make sure that you're on on top of your game and you're always looking for different ways of doing things um not at the moment i'll just say that um i'm just keeping it as original as possible as possible and just um just staying with my style because at the moment because like i said it was it's still pretty new so mm -hmm. i mean it's still got legs on it for the time being but we'll just see what happens i mean with music it always evolves and you know, hopefully I'm a part of it when it evolves and changes into something else. But till then, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Now, another thing that you've done a lot of is remixes. Yeah. Um, not 50, <laughs> <laughs> but 15. Um, and a lot of those remixes made, you know, quite a lot of impact in the outside world. Um, can we have a listen to one of your remixes? I know that you, you um, perhaps the Fortet one? Yeah. yeah um, or something else. It's up to you. Yeah, we can do. Um, you are the music maker. We done, we done. I done this one um, for um, Fortet um, in October, October, November. I think it was. Um, it's called Love Cry. Um, we released it um, in December um, with Joy Oberson's mix as well. So, what's the process then? You are told you're going to do a remix. What do you do next? Um, what I do is, um, I've, I didn't hear the um, original at all before, and anyway, so I just, um, I just asked um, Fortet for the uh, all the parts to the track, and then um, I look through the whole part, all the parts, delete all the parts that I don't like, and just keep what I want to keep. So, and then I'll just work around what I've got, and like with this one, I mean, it's not that I didn't like the parts anyway. I just all I kept out of the whole thing was the female just saying, um, love, love me. Um, and uh, yeah, I just kind of worked around that and kept it as simple as possible. Because some people will kind of, when they get a remix, they'll have a track and then kind of use the parts on the track. But are you saying that on this one, your approach was to keep the parts of the track and then build a new piece around it? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes it depends how I feel, to be honest. Again, it's like, you know, I keep it as a hobby and I just w I just try and enjoy as much as possible and just work around it. And if I want to make a complete new track out of it, then I'll do that. Otherwise, there's someone, some tracks, like I've done a remix for a Z Bias Neighbourhood and uh, I just, I, I took the parts, the original parts of the track and I, st I used it where because because the original was such a great tune, I took those parts and emphasised on it more rather than starting a new one because it wouldn't make sense. So it depends on what sort of tune you're working with. If it's, if it's a classic like Neighbourhood, then, you know, it makes sense to use the original parts. Well, I guess we should hear another remix then. Yeah, I'll play. Yeah. Choose us another one. Um, um, this is the one that I've done for um, a label called Night Slugs. Um, it's called Square One. It's by, um, the original is by a um, guy called Mosca. Mosca, Mosca. <laughs> 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 of how you want people to feel or respond when they hear your tunes not at all I, again like i said <laughs> i just like with my music again i just majority of the time i make it for myself even if i do a remix as well i've had i've had plenty of times where um i've been requested to do a remix and they're like oh we're not feeling it it's not what we're what we're after but you know if they're after a roscoe remix then why ask me to do something that you know what I mean because at the end of the day it's coming from what I want to how I feel at the time and how I want to how I want my music to sound they should just build themselves a Roscoe robot if that's what they're after they should just ask me for the tag and just put it on their track <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna hand it out to the floor in a in a minute or two so if you guys have questions now's the time to kind of formulate them and get them ready to ask um but you've got something else to play us from the album haven't you or have you got something else to play yeah us from I've got um I can play anything um yeah, it's 11 tracks on this album. Give me a number from like 1 to 11, someone, <laughs> and I'll play it. Although not uh, worthy of a song. One, yeah? 
I played one already, sorry. <laughs> Seven, yeah? All right, cool. <laughs> Oh, seven sounds like a, seven sounds very similar to number one. <laughs> Four, yeah? All right, cool. That'll do. Oh, yeah. What was that? Um, that one was called Squawk. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you can tell why, yeah? yeah. <laughs> but it's nice to hear those sounds instead of, you know, like, I mean, it's great to hear those big kind of wavy synth lines, but it's kind of nice to hear the idea, but kind of done slightly differently. But enough of... What I want to ask. Um, who has a question for Mr. Roscoe? And remember, you need to wait for the microphone first before you speak. And if you haven't got any questions, I'm going to come and get you all. We have over here first. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's, it might seem like a pretty basic question, but uh, related to what you were saying before about layering kicks and snares, yes. um, th often the problem of phasing uh, turns up, especially with kicks, when you layer them, they tend to, the signal phases and, and causes distortion. Do you have a tip for that, for how to prevent that? Um, when I use, when I use different kicks, I use like, I'll, I'll use one that's an open, like a, an airy sort of kick. Yeah. Um, and then I'll use another one as a like, sort of a tight knit kick. So it's like, it will, it will give that. So if you haven't got the punch in your, yeah. in your larger kick, then it'll, the smaller kick will give it that extra edge that's what I do and I also mess about with like obviously the volumes as well to make sure as well so and what I do is as well is um, if you want one kick to be the main kick you take the edge off the first one so you may you may be lower it so in terms of like looking at it as, a, as like a, um, in volume like the first kick would look like that obviously from your angle like yeah. that and then the first one will be like that do you okay. understand what I mean so the, the main kick you want will come in and then the other one will kind of yeah. Yeah, just yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I think we had a question here as well. Um, I was just was interested to know what kind of things you use to get all your sounds, and whether it's like you you said that you like to make things quite quickly because you have ideas in your head. Um, do you like to source things and spend some time finding the sounds, or do you, do you rather just getting straight into it and just you know just um, picking something that works right then and and then that's it? Um, I do a bit of bo both what you said. So s sometimes I may spend like a whole day um, just looking for specific sounds and then just save the pr save it as a preset and then use it later on. Um, and then lo a lot of the time I do just experiment and then just whatever goes goes. That's 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 where I'll get my sort of my enjoyment from just messing about at a, at a time. Okay, where's the microphone going next? Um. Uh, I have like two questions. The first one is this: um, you kind of like fit into a particular genre of music. So how how do you do it when you have to work with artists from like jazz, so rock? And then if I'm like someone that isn't like fixed into a particular genre, I'm like versatile. How do I how do I like find my own place? Um, in terms of finding your own place, I mean, that's down to whatever sort of style that you're, you you want to portray. And maybe sometimes you have to sort of set yourself like a template up in terms of um, how that sounds. So like for, as, for, as an example, like if you're doing like hip hop, for instance, maybe start off as a simple hip hop drum pattern and then add your own interpretation on top of that and take that away. Um, with And when it comes to like, um, fitting into a genre um what you may need to like what i've done was i worked with a guy um called sam from this guy, um, company called the carter project yeah he's a jazz musician yeah um, i didn't bring the track with me but um he does he plays just jazz instruments so what i done was i set my own drum pattern up i gave it to him and let him work on top of that then it gave us that sound so um it kind of still it fits in with what my genre what i what i what i, what I, what I specialize in and it's got that element of jazz into it, so it brings that influence into it instead. Cool. Thank you. Hey, um, do you mix and master your own stuff? Or um, and if you do, what instrument, um, what software or hardware do you use? 
Um, I usually mix down in uh, Fruity Loops. I use Fruity Loops to make my tunes. Um, and then if I master it, I'll go and get it mastered. Um, I, um, I've got, I use Music House um, to master. Or um, on my album, my album was mixed down at a masterpiece. So, um, but most of the tracks, you, mo um, the tracks I played off my album, they were all mastered there. Um, some of the ones that I played, like the Square One remix, um, Feline, they weren't even mastered. I couldn't afford it. Like when I was first started, I couldn't even afford it. So I just done it. What I used to do is um, I, I, list, I would listen to like um, a mastered track already, and then I would just listen out to how it sounds, and then I would mix my track down as much as possible to get that similar sound. So that's what I would do. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Interesting. Yeah, this is not like related to your music. I just want to see what you feel inside. But if you could uh, travel, what would you rather do? Travel like every single country in the whole world or go to the moon? Go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, depends how I'm feeling. I'll probably, I'd love to go to every single country just to see how it is. But the moon sounds quite interesting, so I'll probably go there. <laughs> okay. Anywhere else? Okay, I guess you're all feeling shy today. Um, so you can definitely come and ask Roscoe some questions yourself if you want to. And all that leaves us to do is to say, Roscoe, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.